We are live. Friends, welcome to the 2018 Global Dialogue on Waste, to the second day of the 2018 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, today we'll be talking about um, how Europe and the US could learn from each other. Um, um, we believe that both, both continents are dealing with similar problems when it comes to recycling and a waste diversion. Um, but the set of tools that are being used, uh, that are being um, explored by both continents are very divergent um, and very different, whether they are social uh, solutions or technological solutions. So um, I think that provides a huge potential for you know both continents to learn from each other and um, apply some success stories um, across the across the Atlantic. Um, and um, before we get into the discussion, um, we already have Ad Lansing with us, our first speaker today. Uh, but before I in, uh, introduce him and then we get into the discussion, let me um, tell you about what we've been doing in, over the past five years. Uh, my name is Ranjit Anipu. I'm a senior waste management consultant, and I'm also a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. Um, if you have any questions or comments, use the live chat window below the video stream to send them to Ad and other speakers. And um, and uh, Be Waste Wise started in 2013 with about eight events. And our mission was to connect people who are looking for solutions to with those who could provide those solutions. And I think we've done a great job um, since 2013. We've um, uh, we brought more than 200 um, experts from around the world to you know provide solutions, and we've provided them um, in a very easily accessible manner through webinars and also through recorded conversations, which can be consumed very easily by our audience. And um, we started with. Um, eight events in 2013, but now we, uh, this year we did almost 35 events, which is um, a one event every one and a half weeks. And next year we're trying to get closer to a one event every week. And we're looking for regional part partners um, who, could, uh, who have access to knowledge and who are willing to share that with um, the rest of the world. So um, if you're one of those organizations, you know, approach us. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and we believe in investing uh, in our collective future together um, so that, um, you know, when it comes to nonprofits, it's like parental care. You don't get an IRR um, every quarter, but um, uh, it, it has a huge impact in the way that we live in this world. So um, with that, let me um, welcome Ad to uh, Be Waste Wise. Is not new to Be Waste Wise, but this is the first time he's on video on Be Waste Wise. So, um, Ad, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm um, actually an old man uh, already because I started uh, my life in 1934, so I'm 84. But uh, uh, actually, I had, I had two uh, jobs. Uh, first, I was uh, many many years uh, a biochemist in a university hospital and thereafter i became a member of parliament in 1977 uh, dutch parliament and i was member of parliament uh, during 21 years and thereafter i became a member of supervisory boards uh, and so on and also uh, i became a chairman of the dutch recycling uh, platform uh, and at that time, I uh, decided also to, to write uh, columns and so on about one of the topics uh, of my political career. Uh, one of the topics is energy and your energy policy and the other one, uh, waste management and, uh, and recycling. So that's a uh, uh, very short overview about my uh, uh, professional life. Right, great. Um, first of all, thank you so much for sending your book to me. Um, I read it and I thought it was really great, um, especially the last chapter. Um, but uh, before we get into discussing the book and the ideas that it presents, um, I just want to understand why did you write the book saying that um, wanting to connect circular economy and waste management? Don't you think um, circular economy already covers um, waste hierarchy? Uh, why did you see the need to, you know, write a book on finding connections? Yes, I, I wrote uh, uh, "Challenging Changes." That's the uh, that's the name, the title, for more reasons. Uh, first, uh, to explain the relation between um, the waste hierarchy, the ladder of uh, Lansing, uh, and circular economy. 
de wijshiërarchie is in mijn opinie een essential tool, een guide map voor een circular uh, economy. Secondly, I want uh, to warn uh, of the pitfalls during the transition to uh, circular economy. Some people think uh, that only mentioning the words circular economy uh, solves all problems. Uh, I advocate a realistic uh, and careful approach without marketing tricks. And the third uh, reason, after my first book, uh, I, I have written an uh, a Dutch book about um, uh, cycles and, and uh, waste cycles uh, in 2009, 2010. Uh, the name was uh, De Kracht van de Kringloop in Dutch, uh, Circular Power or something like that. Uh, and at that moment, uh, some people uh, asked me to translate that book in English because of the, um, uh, the contents of that book. But that was not possible because it was, a, uh, it was based on the Dutch uh, situation and all examples and so on. Uh, so I didn't uh, translate that. But afterwards, uh, 2014 uh, and 2015, uh, again, some uh, recycling and companies and other people asked me uh, to, read, to write a book about the relation. And, and they uh, have also uh, put some money together uh, to make it possible. So that's, uh, and then I started and, uh, towards the end of 2015 to write uh, a, new, a new book. So that's, um, uh, <coughs> uh, um, all, all, it was also possible to interview. Uh, I can interrupt you. Um, sorry, um, if I can interrupt you. Um, so um, when we were um, talking earlier, you mentioned that um, when you um, designed the uh, waste hierarchy, some people said that, um, you know, it wasn't circular or that um, it, it wasn't um, applicable to, uh, you know, modern day um, rhetoric on, on, on the environment. So um, could you talk about that aspect on, you know, on how, whether, on how waste hierarchy and the circular economy are um, connected? Yes, the, the, um, when I uh, made a proposal in the Dutch Parliament in 1979, already the first three steps are uh, circular steps. Uh, prevention is absolute necessary, uh, uh, also in qualitative and in quantitative uh, sense, but also uh, reusing products and reusing uh, materials is a kind of a circle. Um, the, for, the first step of the ladder, that's uh, incineration or energy recovery, this is energy recovery, that's partly uh, a, a cycle. Uh, uh, the last step isn't, of course, landfilling, unless uh, uh, you uh, will go to urban mining. So, uh, one of the people in the Netherlands, a uh, famous old minister, told me, uh, several years ago, your system was already uh, circular in most aspects. And uh, I think that uh, uh, some researchers and other people have forgotten uh, that, that, uh, that point. So that was also one of the reasons to, to, to show uh, the history and, and, and the drivers who have put forward me on the road to the uh, waste hierarchy. Well, that's that's my answer on this right. this point. Right. Great. Um, and um, and let, let me just um, connect what we've been discussing in the global dialogue on waste yesterday, and then to you know maybe set a tone for what we'll be discussing for the later um, you know for the rest uh, rest of this day. Um, and yesterday, you know, we were speaking about new systems for North America, and um, so I just wanted to get a sense of what you think the new systems for Europe might look like uh, when it comes to. Um, waste diversion, but also when it comes to circular economy and recycling. Um, you know, um, who will be the stakeholders? Will where will be most of the um, uh, speed um, in terms of change? So, what do you see? What kind of changes do you see, and how do you see the new systems? Yeah, first I have to mention that in Europe, uh, legislation has a very large uh, influence, um, uh, despite. Uh, the historical and economical differences between West, Western part and Eastern part of Europe. Uh, so the European waste directives, that's the 
that are the pieces of legislation uh, from the European Co Commission uh, are very uh, important, play an important role. The uh, important keywords um, are uh, prevention, design for recycling, uh, recycling rates to a, a certain uh, level, high level, um, a specific level of energy recovery, and the ban on landfilling. That are the main uh, issues, and they have put in that new uh, waste uh, directives. Uh, for the, also, the, the last one from uh, 2018, so several months ago. Uh, an important uh, part of the work has to has to do with the public uh, uh, awareness. Public awareness is very high, especially in uh, Western Europe, not in Greece, uh, for instance, but in in, uh, uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in France, and so on. High public awareness, but that awareness is lower now than several years, several decades ago. Uh, ago, and uh, so. In my opinion, public uh, pressure seems to decrease, especially uh, when results remain invisible. Uh, recycling companies has to show that what what they uh, are doing with with the all kind of materials. At present, uh, some installation companies have not enough room to burn our own waste because of the high import contracts, and now they have uh, put it on landfill. Uh, which, which, uh, and that's that's not uh, not not good, of course. Um, so, I, 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 uh, but, uh, I'm sorry um, to interrupt you in, uh, again, but um, you said that um, public awareness is lower now than um, in earlier decades. But then, um, with you know um, documentaries like Blue Planet um, in the UK, and um, you know Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, there seems to be a huge momentum riding you know there seems to be a huge uh, movement towards you know better waste management practices um now than you know at any point in time at least that's what it looks like to me but I i'm sure you know you've seen a lot of movements um ebb and you know flow so um can you uh, tell us a little bit more about why you think um public awareness is lower now yeah you are saying it looks like that's that's indeed true because um the uh, Alan MacArthur Foundation is a very uh, good and strong foundation, has a good name and doing a lot of job, but that's not the same as the public. Uh, if uh, local authorities uh, uh, choose uh, the wrong system for collecting uh, uh, waste, uh, putting together two uh, 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 several streams, that's not, uh, not a good idea. So uh, the discussions and, uh, about circular economy and, and all the work of the uh, that's that's very good indeed. But there is a difference with the public behavior. Uh, because if people see uh, not see results, uh, then they will go uh, will will, will uh, not uh, uh, cooperate uh, any longer. It's not so so bad at this moment, but I see uh, new, less uh, enthusiasm than several years ago. So perhaps we, we have to, to work also on that uh, uh, point. There are, of course, new uh, stakeholders and new, new actors in the field, uh, very small companies. Here in the, my hometown, uh, for instance, we have a, uh, we call it a breed, breeding or breed factory, which is very small uh, uh, companies, which are doing very good jobs, well, on a very uh, small scale. And in the higher uh, segments of industry, yeah, we have, of course, Unilever and DSM and, and, and all the companies, which are, have also nice projects, but, uh, but not all uh, companies have the same feeling. So also in that point, there is uh, uh, much uh, work to do, I think. All right. And um, uh, something that I wanted to get um, from you before we um, started the rest of the discussion was um, about the pace of change. Um, you know, you've seen many movements, you know, come and go when it comes to sustainability. So um, I just wanted to understand what you think about the current pace of change. You know, um, is social media making it any faster um, to um, reach out to um, stakeholders and, you know, create that kind of engagement that's required to create change? Or, um, or is it very similar? Are, are the systems and the stakeholders acting in very similar ways to earlier. You know, what do you think about that? 
I think that the actual uh, pace is, is, is higher than uh, years ago, of course, uh, but not uh, high enough. Uh, will you uh, uh, reach a transition in 2030 or 2050, uh, for instance, uh, with, with a, a large extent? Uh, if you look for um, uh, my uh, proposal from 79, and at, at the moment, 40 years ago, that, had, that took 40 years uh, to put uh, the proposals in, in uh, legislation and uh, active legislation. And till up now, uh, there is discussion in the Netherlands, for instance, and also in, uh, in Europe, a discussion about um, the advantages and disadvantages of, of uh, mono streams and mixed streams of uh, uh, separation before and afterwards. Uh, so you see that uh, this, uh, if if I look to that point, if I see that point, then I think that the pace uh, is not not uh, rapid en uh, enough. Right, and um, so well. Before we get to the next question, let me uh, remind um, our audience that um, my name is Rajat Anepu. I'm a senior waste management consultant, and I'm also a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. Um, we've been organizing webinars to make it easy for people looking for solutions to uh, connect with people who can provide those solutions. And uh, um, our our mission statement has been to uh, our mission has been to invest in our collective future as a nonprofit. And um, so, if you have any questions or comments for um, Ad, um, use the live chat window below the video stream and then send it to us. And um, so after that, Ad. Um, can you, um, so while I was reading your book, I thought something that you mentioned in it was um, really interesting, which is that um, you say that um, circular economy is possible if it creates value. Um, and when you say value, does that mean GDP value? Because that's, you know, one of the very few values that is generally used by decision makers at, you know, at a high level or is, is properly documented and tracked. Uh, I, I uh, yes, on a certain place I uh, mentioned the uh, GDP. That's uh, the, uh, that's an important indicator to determine the economic performance of a whole country or region, and also important for international competitors. But anyhow, I I uh, I want to um, emphasize that value has more uh, angels. Uh, especially social ones, but also environmental uh, ones. So, if if you look uh, <coughs> to social values as employment opportunities, health, uh, safety, uh, and welfare, that's that's also important. The problem is, of course, that you cannot uh, quantify that, uh, and you cannot uh, you cannot co compare it with financial results of business models and so on. What's important? And that the same is true for environmental values, such as biodiversity, uh, sustainability, and so on. It's still a problem to compare those points with the financial uh, figures, of course. I have to mention another uh, point uh, I've forgotten uh, in the last question, but uh, about uh, the pace. Uh, I think I think that the pace will be uh, high pace will be uh, very difficult because of uh, some factors um, uh, and that's 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 the reason uh, why I have, have uh, paid special attention in my book about uh, points as circular dilemmas and also uh, leakages uh, leakages uh, uh, material that flows out the system uh, because we have not uh, technical measures to, to, to uh, recycle it uh, but also financial uh, leakages and uh, about the dilemmas, it is very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, one of the dilemmas is, if we, do we give the, uh, uh, the companies all uh, responsibility, produce responsibility, external or not, uh, or the government, or something between? Uh, that's one point. The other is, for instance, the point of the lease uh, society. And um, um, I need to you. Um, there, um, since you were talking about circular uh, dilemmas, and um, you're saying that um, it's difficult to uh, pinpoint who has the responsibility in certain situations, but why does it have to be that 
for the entire planet. I mean, because waste is a local issue, environmental issues are mostly, you know, they're global challenges, but most of the solutions are very local. So um, why can't it be that different um, localities or different communities go with different models where in each model there could be someone held responsible and, you know, based on what the situation there is? Why does it have to be a dilemma? That's because waste is, uh, indeed, waste is a local issue and you can solve it in a local way. But if you go from waste management to resource management, uh, from primary resources to secondary resources, then you have to uh, fight against all these markets all over the world. So then you, you uh, will, uh, will be a member of a, of a global co community which has to decide uh, uh, do we use uh, uh, secondary resources or uh, do we choose for the uh, cheapest one? Uh, that's that's very important, not only in the plastic uh, uh, world, but also uh, uh, in other, in other uh, segments of industry. So it, uh, this you cannot say it, it's only, you can solve it in a, a local, uh, of course, in, in a very uh, local area, you can uh, do uh, what you want to do. But all people uh, have also uh, relations to other uh, regions, uh, other uh, countries and so on. So it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a big big problem to uh, to manage that. Of course, uh, there will be a large difference and remain difference between all countries, but there will also be some uh, common uh, common issues. Uh, looking for for instance the sustainable uh, development goals of the United Nations. Um, um, something else that was really interesting uh, from your book was um, you talking about. Um, various implementation implementation velocities um, and measures um, and I thought that was really interesting because in current day rhetoric um, everyone's expected to do a, to do a certain thing um, and only that thing uh, and sometimes um, when it comes to you know our next speaker Mitch Hedlund you know with recycle across America standardization has um, uh, its virtues and is probably some sometimes the best thing that can happen. Uh, but again, when it comes to other measures, um, it, it uh, you you say that it doesn't have to be that case. That there could be different implementation velocities and different um, measures that we can work on at different speeds. So, could you talk about that a little bit? Could you expand on what, what you mean by that? Yeah, that's um, my uh, idea about uh, two or more uh, velocities has uh, much to do with uh, the European situation. Uh, we, in, in Europe, we have a large difference between the Western and Eastern part, also in the recycling race and so on. And I think that uh, if I look to uh, Poland, for instance, uh, they have a figure of, uh, I have to look for it, uh, 38% and uh, Belgium 78% uh, in recycling rate. So that's a very di big difference. And I think that the new European waste directive cannot uh, uh, expect that both countries uh, will reach 80% uh, on the, in the same year, on the same uh, decade. So uh, I, I think that we have to accept that uh, several countries will will uh, go and not so not so fast as uh, other ones. That's that's my uh, my first uh, point. The second one is of course. Uh, that if you look on, on a larger scale, United States, China, India, and so on, uh, there will be an, uh, still larger differences, uh, also in the economic sense, prosperity, and so on, and welfare. Uh, so we have, we cannot uh, ask an all people all over the world the same, uh, the same uh, actions, the same instruments, and so on. Um, uh, there are also the p political differences. Um, uh, you see it now in the, uh, the battle between the United States and, and, and China of uh, India. Uh, so uh, um, we, we, will, we have to accept uh, several uh, implementation uh, philosophies, uh, even in, in Europe. Right. And um, again, um, coming back to the question of pace of change. Um, so how much time, um, I, I mean, we've seen um, recycling start in the early 
um, well, the, uh, the public awareness for recycling and environmental, you know, um, change started in the early 60s and 70s in US and Europe. And we are here today um, where, you know, Belgium has 70 plus recycling, but most of that recycling is still going, is being exported. Most of that recyclables are still being exported to a um, poorer country to be taken care of there. So, um, I, I mean, that's the situation that we've come to after, let's say, six decades of um, you know consistent education in the US and Europe and consistent investment in recycling systems. So um, what's the timeline and what kind of changes do you expect to see in the next few years or in maybe in the next um, decade or so? Um, uh, uh, first, uh, we have uh, to, clean, uh, to clean up the figures, of course, uh, because not all figures are uh, comparable uh, with each other. If the one country says we have 70% uh, of 80% recycling, but they count also the material which, what has been done to China, that's not a good <laughs> uh, idea, I think. You have to, to look for the output. And you have to also, uh, and that's also the reason why I have also written a, a small chapter about uh, terms and terminology, and so we have to, uh, uh, to we, we have to use the same ideas, the same uh, words, uh, the same uh, formulas uh, to calculate. Uh, that's that's uh, one. Then, if you look uh, to the different uh, uh, aspects of resource management and also to the different uh, partners which have to uh, uh, take part in that in that uh, 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 chain, in all kind of chains. And then I, I think we need uh, at least uh, 10 years, at least 10 years uh, to, to, to uh, reach a level of, uh, for instance, 30, 40 percent uh, on the scale of the transition. It's, it's not possible. Uh, we, we never can reach uh, 100 percent, of course, but um, uh, 50 percent is, is, a, is, a, is a nice aim. And I think that we cannot uh, reach that. Uh, we cannot reach it. Perhaps in 2030, but then uh, we have uh, to do a lot of work, also in research, in new technologies, new designs, uh, new materials, and so on. So that it, it will be a very, very uh, difficult task, and that's also the reason why I uh, have put forward uh, several ideas uh, in the last in my last chapter, a summary of those points which which are important in my, in my opinion. Of course, you can discuss about uh, a lot of points, but uh, yeah, I, I have to stand for my uh, ideas, of course. Yeah. Right, uh, yeah, I, um, I, that sounds good. And, um, and I, that just reminds me of um, something that, um, you know, it's, it's a common saying, which is that we underestimate what we do in the short term, uh, sorry, we overestimate what we do in the short term and underestimate what we do in the long term. So um, in, in when we're facing challenges like this, I think it's really important for us to, um, you know, understand that and then kind of build institutions and um, measures that can work on the long term while also focusing on short term uh, impacts. And um, let me just remind everyone that we have 30 minutes into the discussion, the last five, it's uh, just 15 minutes to go. So if you have any questions, use the live chat window. Uh, my name is Ranjit Anipu and we have Ad Lansing with us. And um, uh, be waste wise, we've helped um, organizations like ESWA. We have uh, uh, the International Solid Waste Association. We've done about six webinars with them this year, where we've helped um, their publications and their initiatives reach a wider audience. And uh, we've also helped organizations like the Asian Development Bank and um, MWS Global and Northern Cyprus. Um, Stephen Bates, who will be um, joining us um, for the next session. He'll talk a little bit about the work that's that's happening there. Um, so if you're an organization who has access to knowledge, uh, who has um, you know expertise, then um, do reach us out, uh, reach reach out to us, and then we can um, try to work together in you know, in making this knowledge available for a wider um, audience. Um, because waste is a global challenge with local solutions, and um, the amount of knowledge dissemination that's required to find those local solutions is immense. And we need um, efficient systems, um, easily scalable systems like, you know, be waste wise webinars to be able to achieve those. Um, and with that ad, um, 
So um, uh, this is also um, an interesting topic for me, which is you know expectations that are created by certain movements. Um, and um, and I was reading an article uh, recently which says that humans are a, a post-truth species, which means that we've always had fictions and certain expectations should be created so that we can work together towards certain goals. Um, and in your book, you mentioned that um, you know, um, when it comes to movements, sustainability movements, we create high expectations which cannot be met. But do you see a role for creating those high expectations? Um, and what do you think about that overall? Yes, that uh, uh, the word expectation is, is of course, a, uh, a, a nice uh, term uh, because it, indeed every every uh, man or woman on earth has some expectations and want to uh, strive to something uh, else to, to uh, something new to uh, to look and so on that that's uh, of course uh, a good thing but uh, i mentioned expectations in my book uh, too high expectations because i saw that some people discussing uh, circular economy especially in that uh, segment of, of life uh, put forward 100% uh, circular economy. That's not possible, uh, uh, not in theoretical, theoretical sense, not in practical sense. So then you have not to put that as an expectation. Uh, another example is uh, Michael Brownwright, and you know him, of course, with Cradle to Cradle. I had some discussions with him, and on a certain uh, time um, he told me uh, waste is food, in my opinion, waste, he said, he said, waste is food. And uh, if we follow my concept, my philosophy, waste is food, then we can, uh, the, then there are no limits to uh, for consumers. They can uh, buy all things and use all, all kinds of things. And then I ask him, and what about energy of, of materials and products and so on? We have to make them, we, have, we need energy. And then he answered, um, uh, <coughs> he answered me, uh, in my opinion, all energy will be renewable in the future. Uh, then I, I told him that's, that's in my opinion, not, uh, not uh, possible unless we have uh, systems to, to the, uh, <coughs> for um, uh, wind energy and solar energy, which we can uh, uh, prepare for, for later. But, um, uh, then he said another thing. I, I say, why not prevention? And he, he told me that he was against prevention. And I, I say, I need prevention uh, to have the circle on a certain uh, level. And he said, prevention is something for guilty people. And I didn't understand that. In later uh, years, he, he has uh, uh, some, he has taken back uh, that kind of things. But anyhow, if you say all waste is food and you can use all things uh, unlimited, uh, that's not a good idea. So that's that's a too high ex expectation, uh, leaving out uh, prevention. Prevention is essential also, of course, for uh, material which we, uh, we cannot uh, uh, use uh, anyhow. So that's well point. The other point is, um, uh, that I mentioned also in, in my book, there are also fields uh, which are overlooked at this moment. The phosphates, uh, of course, uh, one Another uh, field with very much attention without uh, good ideas that the plastic, uh, now you see the discussion about do we, do we need the ocean clean up uh, and burn it? Or have we to, do we ask the plastic energy such a form that as uh, design uh, that we have no uh, any longer uh, plastic soup. So, um, in that that kind of discussions, you have to find the right way, and that's also a, a, a very difficult a difficult point. And you know, um, uh, uh, the um, exchange of information, such as B Waste is now doing all many many years, uh, for five or six years, is a very good idea. Uh, so this, uh, I congratulate you with, with, with that work. We have met uh, each other uh, never 
uh, yeah, now uh, on this way, but there is still uh, some uh, cooperation uh, with that crowd asking uh, project, and uh, that was one of the drivers for me also to look for an English uh, text. Uh, so the, uh, so that that we have to inform and to discuss, and then to find out which is the 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 best way uh, to go ahead. Um, no, um, we're glad we could um, we, we we were you know useful in that way. Um, since you mentioned uh, mentioned ocean plastics and uh, single use plastics, um, we have Emma Burlow and Kate Bailey. Uh, Kate Bailey works at EcoCycle International um, in the U.S. and Emma Burlow works at Resource Futures. Um, both of them will be talking about the single-use plastics um, later on today. And um, Emma's um, team has um, authored a report called um, Eliminating, Avoiding, um, Eliminating All Avoidable Plastic. And they've put together, a, a, I think, a wonderful characterization of all single-use plastics. So th there is a lot of noise on, uh, around single-use plastics. Uh, and I think they provided a very methodological approach on you know, what needs to happen next. Um, so um, we'll be talking about that. So um, friends, if you're um, listening in um, to add, uh, you know, um, stay until uh, you hear what Emma has to say about um, single-use plastics and the characterization. And maybe yeah. you might be able to use it in your community um, to you know, improve how you deal with single-use plastics. Um, and, um, and I just want to remind you that um, we are talking to Ad Lansing. And if you have any questions or comments, you know, use the live chat window. Um, and Ad, uh, do you have any um, final comments or remarks or uh, key messages that, you know, we didn't touch upon today uh, during the discussion? No, no. Uh, perhaps I may, I may uh, mention about my book also that there are uh, five or six, six interviews with people uh, with also uh, very uh, good ideas. Uh, you know Antolis Mavropoulos um, with his uh, ideas about uh, the influence of the fourth industrial uh, rev revolution. I also uh, spoken with um, uh, Carmen Novella, that's the uh, Euro Commissioner, uh, with his ideas about the legislation and uh, the influence of, of government and governments, uh, not only in Europe. And also interesting is, for instance, the discussion we have uh, not talked about it, but one of the uh, key issues is also uh, which financial policy instruments can governments use uh, to go ahead uh, together with companies, with public and so on. Uh, do we need taxes and uh, which uh, kind of taxes? Do we need uh, deposits, uh, deposit uh, money uh, systems, uh, something like that? Uh, Dominic Hock of uh, um, Anomia and Isonomia is talking about that in, in my book. So um, if people uh, want to uh, read more about it, uh, then I will. Uh, uh, point to the website of that book, that is uh, www.challengingchanges.org, then they f find all information also about the contents. And also they can order, of course, uh, the book. All right. That's uh, um, advertisement. <laughs> no, yeah, um, gr great. Thank you so much, Anne, for joining us. Um, we really wanted to un um, set a tone and, you know, get the philosophy uh, behind, you know, what's been happening in the environmental movements over the past few decades and, you know, what it might look um, for us in the future, because having that kind of philosophical background gives us a, um, a you know, a place to land whenever, you know, we're um, trying to do something new um, and something goes wrong. So um, thank you so much for that. And um, let me um, hide you from the broadcast and let me bring our next two speakers, Stephen Bates and uh, Mitch Hedlund online. And then we'll start with their um, session. We're starting a few minutes early, but um, I hope that's fine. So uh, thank you so much, Ad. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much.